Darkcast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Do you often find that you need a distraction from everyday life? Do you like true crime, conspiracy theories, paranormal stories, and other weird dark tales? Well, tune in and turn up Weird Distractions Podcast, where we, your hosts, Christy and Alex, bring you a weird distraction to help you get through the work week. Every Sunday morning, you can find our show on Apple Podcasts, Anchor, Spotify, Good Pods, and more. So grab a snack, get comfy, and make sure to lock those doors. Need a distraction? We We got got you. Hey, 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 Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ. After doing a whole month of collaborations with my friend Paige of Reverie True Crime, it's going to be kind of weird to get back into the cycle of what normal was for me. And actually, if truth be known, this month is going to be kind of strange too. What's with all the change? I know, a lot of folks don't like change. But guess what, warriors? I found a home to purchase. And this month, I'll be moving into it. In fact, I'll be starting the actual move process in just about a week. It won't be an easy move either. I'm heading from California to the coast of Oregon. And I think the hardest part will be leaving my daughter behind. She's made a lot of friends and she loves where she's living right now. But it's time for me to cut the apron strings, spread my wings, and fly. This mama bird did her job and now she needs to go live her next best life by the ocean again. I'm on a new adventure, a new journey. But since time is escaping me and I need to pack and clean and all the fun stuff that goes along with moving, some of my podcast friends with the Oracle Network were sweet enough to send me episodes of their shows to listen to for the month of November. Now, all the episodes might not be LGBTQ plus related, but they're from great podcasts. One will be an episode titled San Bernardino from the podcast Active Shooter. My buddy Paige at Reverie True Crimes episode will be about the disappearance of trans woman Sage Smith. And there'll be an episode about screwed up, scary Christian sex. That's S-E-C-T-S, not to be confused with scary Christian sex, S-E-X. This will be for my buddies over at Brew Crime. I hope by the end of this month, I'll be back in your ear holes again with a new episode for my new podcasting room in Oregon. This episode, I bring you my friend Lindsay and her sister Maddie, their host of Ye Old Crime. This is the story of Ann Lister. And you know what? This is an LGBTQ plus story. I'll catch you soon, Rainbow Warriors. The Oracle Network. And welcome to Yield Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hello. How are you? I got my coffee, so I will be fine. I got coffee boba. Ooh. Homemade. But I'm already, like, full of boba now. So <laughs> there's no room, more room for coffee yet. So, <laughs> so much tapioca. We'll see how it goes. I'm full of tapioca. And a little bit of regret. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Is it a good pain? Yes. Yes, it is. Is it worth it? Totally. Mm-hmm. So before we get too far into it, we need to 
acknowledge the fact that this is our one year anniversary episode. That's just bananas. I I didn't think we'd get this far. <laughs> uh, low key, same. Like, I, like I I thought it was just going to be us, and you know, a few of our friends, and we just do it as long as you know we wanted to. But now, like. My boyfriend's like, oh, yeah, that's right. I got to like catch up on your latest episode. And my friends are like, no small tidbits of my life because they listen to the podcast too. If like we haven't caught up in a week and it's very surreal. Like, how did you know that information? Oh, yeah, I put it out on the internet. Right. Oh, yeah, it's out right, in the rest right, right, of the right. world <laughs> where anyone can hear the it. Universe. Great, 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 great. <laughs> So yeah, it's been fun. I've I've had a great time. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed researching and learning about a variety of things that just like I'm sure a majority of our listeners, I knew zero to, well, like very little to zero about. So right. it's been really fun learning about a variety of cases that I just, yeah. Yeah, I never knew that a Camel Corps for the United States military yeah. Like that's, that's just a fun fact to have in your back pocket, aside from just a great story. Like, yeah, it's just a fun tidbit that, you know, I don't know. I really like having stories like this to share because I, I, I think it is important to go back and, and look at all this stuff. And it's nice that we have a platform and there's, there's just enough people who want to listen to it too, that we can keep it going. So thank yeah. you all for continuing to listen. We really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, it's really nice to know that we're not the only ones that are interested in this stuff. Right. <laughs> there are other people. Us and like a few of our friends. <laughs> yeah, that there are other people who are like, you know what? This stuff is pretty great. And they keep listening every week. So thank yeah. you to all of our listeners and our return mm-hmm. repeat listeners that come back every week to hear us ramble our way through another obscure case. And a special thank you to everyone who's been with us from like pretty much the beginning. Right. Thanks for sticking around. Our first episode came out last June. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that don't know, June is Pride Month. And in honor of Pride, the topic of this week's episode, because it's kind, of, it's kind of a wild card type of episode in between okay. our slew of listener requested episodes. Mm-hmm. We will be covering someone in the LGBTQ community. Okay. That being said, I want to note very clearly at the beginning of this episode that the reason I'm including this individual is because at this time in history, it was against the law to be homosexual. This person did not do anything against the law other than be their truest self. But I wanted to make that very clear. I don't feel like this person committed any sort of crime by being who they are. Mm Mm-hmm. But the reason we're including them is because at this point in history, society at large saw it as a crime. Exactly. So I'm going to hate this. <laughs> I don't think I, I don't, already tell. I don't think you'll hate it. I think you'll actually enjoy okay. it. OK, I hope so. So I just wanted to get that out at the beginning of the episode, just so people aren't coming at me like, why do you think homosexuality is a crime? It's not. Absolutely not. No, nope. we are huge supporters of the LGBTQ community. Mm hmm. Alphabet Mafia. <laughs> so, yeah, just putting that up there at the top so people don't come at me and think that I'm horrible. Right. So this week we'll be discussing Anne Lister. Have you heard of her before? No, it's not familiar to me. But awesome. I also, like, don't know a lot of things. So that's... <laughs> Fair. <laughs> nothing new. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think after this, you will have a really... More fun facts. A really fun fact and fun party story that you can share with people. Oh my God, when we go back to parties again? As you spread the good word of the LGBTQ community. So information for this episode was pulled from the following sources. A 2020 the Open University PhD thesis called My Mind on Paper, Ann Lister and Literary self Construction in Early 19th Century Halifax by Anira Rowanchild, 2019 Mental Floss article by Mark Mancini, 2019 Smithsonian Magazine article by Bridget Katz, 2019 Vulture article by Jackson McHenry, 2018 The Guardian article by Harriet Sherwood, the Ann Lister website, Calderdale Museum's website, Historic England, The Legacy Project, Chicago website, and Wikipedia. Nice. And links to all these articles will be included in the show notes. Yay. 
Anne Lister was born on April 3rd, 1791 in Halifax, West Yorkshire, England, to a well-to-do land-owning family who lived in Shibden in Calderdale, West Yorkshire. That was like the biggest sentence ever. Yes, we are in England. So again, blanket <laughs> apology. I'm going to say some names wrong and the names of cities. I apologize. All our friends know. Make sure that we're saying it right. So I totally got schooled when Maddie and I guested on the Everyone Dies in Sunderland podcast because I got one city name like super wrong when I retold the story of Joe the Quilter for them. But to be fair, they were very polite about it and they tried really hard not to laugh. They did. So I appreciate that. You yes. guys, you're very sweet. And mm -hmm. hopefully they won't come at me like after this and be like, you said like 90% of the town names wrong. <laughs> Well, they absolutely will, but they will also be kind of about it again. Yeah, they'll also be like, <laughs> I loved it, but <laughs> here's, uh, here's a list of all of the town names you pronounced wrong. Right. With like the worst pronunciation, like it's, it's just in all caps. Like there's no emphasis. It's just in all caps. That yeah. Point? Anyway, <laughs> Anne was the eldest daughter of Jeremy Lister and Rebecca Battle Lister. Her elder brother, John, had died the same year he was born. Oh. And when she was two, she and her parents moved to an estate named Skelfler House at Market Wayton. It was there shortly after their arrival that her younger brother Samuel was born in 1793. In total, the Listers would have four sons and two daughters, but only Anne and her younger sister Marion lived past the age of 20. Wow. So all of all of their sons died. Mm hmm. Two of her brothers died in infancy, and her brother John, so they had another son named John, passed at the age of 14. Her favorite brother, Samuel, drowned in 1813 at the age of 20. So kind of a tough go. Yeah. Between 1801 and 1805, Anne was taught by Reverend George Skelding, who was the town vicar, until the age of seven, when she was sent to a school in Agnesgate, Ripon, run by Mrs. Heggs and Mrs. Chettle. Okay. I didn't include it in here and I should have gone back, but I guess they ended up kicking her out of the school because she was so like, I don't want to say rowdy, but she was too difficult for them to manage. Okay. So they were just like, we can't do this anymore. Peace out. <laughs> Peace out. Anne was unusually bright and even at a young age was drawn to classic literature. And because of her mm -hmm. intelligence, she was allowed to receive a formal academic education, which was very outside the norm for young right. men during this time in history. But probably part of her like perceived rowdiness was boredom. Probably. She was bored, needed to learn more. Yep. So finally they were like, give this girl a book. <laughs> <laughs> Throw all the books at her. Let her read. <laughs> at the age of 15, Anne began chronicling her most intimate thoughts in her journals starting in 1806. The first three words she ever wrote in her journals were Eliza left us. This was in reference to a girl named Eliza Rain, who Anne met while at the King's Manor boarding school in York. Eliza was a girl of color, not to mention the wealthy daughter of an East India Company surgeon. Okay. The pair shared a bedroom in the slope, which was the attic of the boarding house. And it was during this time that Anne fully embraced her lesbian sexuality by starting a relationship with Eliza. Yeah. However, when Anne began to explore relationships with other women, not everyone was too keen on Anne's sexual proclivities, and she was later asked to leave the school and had to be fetched by her father. Yeah. I was kind of wondering when it was going to come out. Yep. Okay. So how old would she be around that, this time? She was 15. Okay. So the sentence Eliza left us is in reference to after she left school, Eliza came to visit them for a time and she stayed with them for a while, I think during the summer. And oh, that was probably such a nice summer. Looking yeah. Really hard. Yeah. So then when she left to go back to the boarding school, that was really hard on Anne. And that's I when bet. she started her diary by saying Eliza left us. So Eliza oh. didn't die. Which is good because that's kind of one of the first things you think about. I mean, she eventually died, but at this point in time, oh, right. she was just going back to school. While attending school in York, Anne was introduced to a more moneyed group of women. And although she came from a moderately wealthy rural family, she had aspirations to climb the social ladder. I mean, many do. Yep. One symbol of her family's wealth and status was Shibden Hall, a Tudor-style home near Halifax that had been in her family for more than 200 years since the 15th century. Okay. 
Anne's uncle James Lister, who was a perpetual bachelor, inherited Shipton and its 400 acres, but had little interest in managing it. A perpetual bachelor? Yeah. Quote unquote. I don't, I don't think he leaned that way, but he, he just never married. Hmm. I mean, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. No judgment. You do you. Yeah, you do you. You want to be a bachelor and not take care of the, your giant house? Sure. Yeah. You just want to live there. That's cool. Yeah. You want to do anything. Anne would move into Shibden Hall to live with her uncle and her aunt, who was also named Anne, in 1815 at the age of 24. Okay. Isn't that kind of old? Yeah. At the time? So it would have been like a bunch of binster. Yeah. Yeah. Binsters. Yeah. Her aunt was very much a thornback. Like she... Um, she also never married. How scandalous. Yeah. So her aunt and uncle were siblings and both were unmarried and childless. And they just kind of... It's so strange at the time. Wow. Yeah. Like kind of good for them for not doing it. Yeah. And basically took over running the estate under her uncle's guidance, even going so far as helping with the day-to-day -day work and took part in such quote-unquote masculine activities as shooting and writing. Nice. But she'd be good at that. Anne used her journals, specifically the entries that were written in code, as a way to interpret and understand her lesbianism at a time when being anything other than heterosexual was frowned upon. This that habit of writing in her journals is one that she would continue through her adulthood, filling 6,600 pages with over 4 million words in 26 hardbacked books. Wow, that's, in that's incredible. About a sixth of her entries were penned in a secret code with symbols and letters that she devised to hide her sexual relationships with other women. The code nice. was a combination of algebra and the Greek alphabet in a language that Anne dubbed as her crypt hand. Interesting. Uh -huh. I like it. Her first journal spanned from Wednesday, August 11th, 1806, when she was 15, to Thursday, February 22nd, 1810, when she was 19. Hmm. In that year, Anne became friends with a woman named Isabella Tibb Norcliffe. Tibb was her nickname, who would okay. become her lifelong friend and occasional lover. Nice. Isabella remained single the whole of her life, and Anne's refusal to take her as a life partner due to her drinking was a bitter pill for her to mm. swallow. Yeah, I can see that. It was Isabella who introduced Anne to Mariana Belcombe in 1814, an introduction Isabella bitterly regretted after the fact. Mm -hmm. Anne was 23 when she met Mariana, who she referred to as M in her diaries. The pair embarked on a passionate love affair, which continued even after Mariana married Charles Lawton, a man several decades her senior, for his money two years later in 1816. That never happened. Nope. Ever. I am so surprised. Anne was described as a charismatic and striking woman who shied away from the fashionable white feminine frills of the day for ensembles all in black starting in 1817 at the age of 26. She noted this decision in her journal with the declaration, quote, I have entered upon my plan of always wearing black, end quote, as she mm -hmm. felt it complemented her wiry frame. I mean, do you? That sounds great. At times, she even donned men's dress. She enjoyed long walks around the Shibden estate, so she took to wearing thick leather boots that were often worn by the gentry and saw black as a masculine color, so she soon updated her entire wardrobe with black bodices and long black coats. Nice. Some people believe that Anne chose to dress in black as a form of quasi-mourning after Mariana's marriage to Charles. Yeah, I could see that. Anne used her love of literature as a form of flirting by mentioning books or plays that featured LGBTQ issues, such mm. as writings by the Roman poet Juvenal, who held very strong opinions regarding homosexuality. Okay. She would gauge by the woman's reaction if her advances would prove successful. Honestly, that's really clever. Right? And I feel like there, even to this day, when I would say a good number of us are more open to this, it's still, you know, is illegal in some places of the world. So I think that's a very clever way to see how safe you are mm -hmm. with these people. Mm -hmm. Following Mariana's marriage, Anne took up journaling again and would use them as a means to not only chronicle her day-to-day -day life, but as a means to work out how she could live both emotionally and sexually in a society that had no place for people like her, whose sexual desires and attractions fell outside the heterosexual norms. Yeah, that would be really tough. 
In fact, it was such a foreign concept that lesbianism wasn't even included in legislation forbidding male homosexuality. So it technically wasn't a crime. Technically. And actually, during this period, it wasn't uncommon for women to have romantic relations with other women. But at that time, it was viewed more almost like close friends. Yeah, I can see that. Like it was almost seen as like people didn't believe it would go past, you know, like chaste kisses and hugs and things like that. Yeah. So more like lifelong companionship, not necessarily carnal relations. Yeah. Anne was obviously heartbroken by Mariana's marriage and subsequent infidelity and was later enraged when in 1820 she contracted an incurable venereal taint from Mariana after her husband Charles contracted it from a dalliance with a servant. Anne would remain infected with this disease, which I'm assuming is herpes, for the rest Mm -hmm. of her life. That sucks. That sucks so hard. Yeah. Anne began traveling abroad in 1819 at the age of 28 with a three-week tour of Paris with her aunt. Travel would become a huge part of her life, with trips to Switzerland and Italy in 1827, visits to Belgium and the Netherlands in 1829, not to mention a stint living in France and the Pyrenees from 1829 to 1830. She also traveled to Holland in 1831, as well as the Isle of Wight and Sussex. Okay. She chose to continue her education in France. I think this was around the time that she had first moved into Shipton Hall. So she would have been, I think, around 24 at this time. Okay. And she took up residence there for several years, attending lectures on such subjects as zoology and mineralogy. She even took up the study of anatomy and converted a section of the flat she was renting into a dissection lab, where she dissected a severed human hand, disembodied ear, and even a woman's head. Nope. Yep. Now she's starting to be a little dumbery. And but it's for science. But it's for science. <laughs> I was listening to a video about her and they said of the the head that she dissected, apparently the subject had so much lice in her hair that she had to like shave her head before she could even oh no, begin the process of dissecting her. That's a bummer for everyone involved. Yes. Including the poor deceased Yes. Now headless woman. Yes. So she would get these parts by working with other obvious, like... Grave diggers. (laughs) There's probably more like... Uh, Like anatomy schools. Yeah. They worked with the grave diggers. Yeah. So she she got them through legal means, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. She also enjoyed traveling to Russia after the country opened up again following the end of the Napoleonic Wars in November of 1815. Honestly, that's probably like the ballsiest move she's done yet. Right. She often referred to her sexual leanings as her oddity and was often the subject of gossip amongst the members of her social circle and would even find herself accosted in public. That doesn't surprise me at all. Helena Whitbread, who cracked the code of Anne's journals and deciphered them in the 1980s, quoted one encounter in particular. Quote, one man followed her up the bank and tried to put his hands up her skirt to find out if she was a man or a woman. She turned on him and raised her umbrella. End quote. I can't say I'm surprised. But good on her for just being like, fuck you, guy. And just like, yeah, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Yeah. Oh, that's so gross. Anne continued to use her journals as emotional and psychological safe harbors. For the rest of her life, she adamantly maintained that she could, quote, love and only love the fairer sex, end quote. Mm. It's believed that her father was aware of and accepted her sexual identity and that her uncle James was also aware of it. I mean, that makes sense to me. That is probably why he gave her a safe haven, too. Mm hmm. You know. Anne continued to love Mariana, who would remain the love of her life until her dying days. In 1823, Anne wrote in her journal, quote, the time, the manner of her marriage. Oh, how it broke the magic of my faith forever, end quote. As I mentioned before, Anne loved to travel. And during a stay Mm -hmm. in Paris from 1824 to 1826, she won the affections of a widow named Maria Barlow. Mm -hmm. At this point, Anne was 33 and looking to secure a relationship with a partner that would allow her to climb in the social ranks. So obviously she wanted to... Kind of a dual thing. She She wanted a sugar mama. She did want a sugar mama. Hey, I mean, I'll power to you. 
Anne was continuing to see Mariana during her brief relationship with Maria, and after a while she ended the relationship with Maria due to the fact that her financial worth and social standing weren't up to her exacting standards. Mm. Yeah. Not quite good enough, which hurts. Yeah. Even though she was raised and practiced as a staunch Anglican, and she was a Protestant, I believe. Okay. Anne refused to marry a man for the sake of any sort of respectability or convenience. Often referred to as Gentleman Jack, Anne wasn't ashamed of her love for women and felt she was made in God's image. In fact, she would often pray to and thank God for making her the way she was. Nice. Anne's uncle James passed in 1826, and as all four of her brothers were deceased, the familial estate of Shibden was entrusted to her at the age of 35. Nice. She rather easily took up the mantle of landowner and businesswoman, easily handling the finances, as well as the overseeing of the coal deposits and quarries she built on the property. Anne secured profits off the canals and timber that made up part of her property and collected mm -hmm. rent from tenants at Shibden Hall as well, which allowed her to continue her adventurous lifestyle. Nice. During her travels, Anne became an avid mountaineer and took to mountain climbing in the Pyrenees Range, which lies between Spain and France. Mm -hmm. In 1830, she became the first woman to ascend Mount Perdue, which is the third tallest mountain in the Pyrenees. Oh, wow. And during a return trip in 1838, she became the first amateur climber to ever scale the female mountain, male or female. So she was the first person ever. Wow. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And it was said it took her, I believe, 10 hours to scale it. And then it took her like seven hours to descend it. That's really impressive. Mm -hmm. After enjoying a few more years of travel, Anne ceased her traveling and settled at Shibden permanently in 1832 at the age of 41. Not all of Anne's tenants seemed to like her very much, and it's said that she refused to rent land to anyone who didn't share her political views. She was a Tory. I mean... I wouldn't. If you can be picky, why not? Yeah. Even after the betrayal of Mariana with her marriage to Charles, Anne longed for a stable relationship with a woman that would be both romantically and financially beneficial to both parties. She wanted, quote, a marriage in every possible sense of the word, end quote. Mm -hmm. In 1832, Anne tried and failed to woo an aristocrat named Ver Hobart. She noted her unhappiness in a diary entry from April 29th. Quote, my high society plans fail, unknown and without connections, money should abound. I have had whim, tried the thing, and pretty much it has cost me. I shall in future perhaps do more wisely and within my compass. I shall now get out of my scrape as well as I can and can manage it tolerably. I have been an Icarus, but shall fall less fatally, for I can still live and be happy, providence be willing. What a comfort my journals, how I can write and crypt all as it really is and throw off my mind and console myself. Thank God for it. End quote. That's really lovely. Mm hmm it would have been pretty novel at that time to have to feel so safe in something that's so vulnerable. I mean, it's kind of how that is now, but yeah. Especially then, yeah. Yeah. Anne would finally find the partner she was looking for, who met all of her social criteria when she reconnected with Anne Walker. Okay. Anne Walker was born May 20th, 1803 at Lightcliffe, West Riding of Yorkshire, to parents John and Mary Edwards Walker. She lived with her family, which consisted of her, her older sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, as well as a younger <laughs> brother named John, until they moved to Crow Nest in 1809 when Walker was six. Her sister Mary passed away in 1815, and Walker lost both of her parents in 1823 at the age of 19. Aww her father on April 22nd, and her mother on November 3rd. Upon her parents' death, her brother John inherited the family estate. In 1828, her older sister Elizabeth married Captain George Mackay Sutherland and moved to Ayrshire. Just two years later in 1830, John would die while on his honeymoon in Naples, leaving the Cronest estate in the care of both Walker and her sister Elizabeth. Ooh, died on his honeymoon, ouch. Right? Please. Walker continued to live at the estate during her 20s and moved into a smaller home on the property named Lydgate in 1831. It was while she resided at Lydgate that she became reacquainted with Anne on July 6, 1832. 
Walker was a shy, wealthy heiress that Anne had been acquainted with since the 1820s. After courting her for many months, Walker eventually came to live at Shibden in 1834, where the pair lived openly as a couple, even though Walker was 12 years Anne's junior. Wow, that's pretty bold. And actually, now that you say, um, what was it, the Jack nickname? Gentleman Jack. Gentleman Jack. There's a show about her. Yep, I was going to get to it, yep. Yeah. That's further in my notes. I know about it. (laughs) That's why so many of my sources are from 2019. Fair. After Walker moved into Shibden, Anne took on an active role in managing the Walker estate on her behalf, which was located near Shibden, so they lived fairly close to one another. Okay. At one point, a dispute broke out regarding a drinking well located on Walker's land. Even though the community at large used the well as a main source of water, Anne viewed it as belonging solely to the Walkers. Oh. To settle the dispute once and for all, Anne had a barrel of tar dumped into the water, thereby making it undrinkable. That's a bitch move. Right? Damn. In retaliation, members of the broader community burnt effigies of Anne and Walker, and a magistrate would later rule in court that the water was, in fact, the property of the people. Yeah. yeah. That, that wasn't super cool, Anne. Yeah. That was one of the few things where I was like, that's kind of a dick move. Mm-hmm. Probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> Wait, like, can't you just give people water? Like, what the hell? Yeah. As I mentioned before, some of her entries could be a bit steamy. Ooh. In one entry dated October 8th, 1832, she stated the following regarding an interrupted encounter she had with Walker. Oh. This is going to get a bit sexual, so hold your pearls, ladies. I'm clutching mine right now. Quote, kissing and pressing her as usual, she put the blind down. Lucky, James had come in on trivial errands twice, and Mrs. Priestley came at four. I had jumped in time and was standing by the fire, but Anne looked red and I pale, and Mrs. P must see we were not particularly expecting or desiring company. She only stayed a few minutes and went off in a suppressed rage today. Miss W laughed and said we were well matched. We soon got to kissing again on the sofa. At last, I got my right hand up her petticoats and after much fumbling, got through the opening of her drawers and touched, first time, the hair and skin of queer. She had never offered the least resistance, end quote. Oh, that would be so hard. <laughs> There's so many right. layers down there, man. Right? Congratulations, gentlemen, Jack. <laughs> like finding a needle in the haystack. Seriously. Good God. <laughs> and then, like, you're constantly interrupted, too. Jesus. Oh, Honest to awful. God, I am so impressed by anyone who was able to have sex during that period in time. Could you like, imagine? Like, ye old quickies, like, did that exist? That probably didn't exist at all. It would take you, like, 20 minutes just to get through everything. <laughs> and by then, it's like, well, I don't, I'm not even hard anymore. Right. What's the point? Right. <laughs> Once Anne decided she wanted to ask Walker to be her wife, she traveled with Walker to York, where she placed her in the care of Dr. Belcombe, who was the father of her ex-lover, Mariana. Oh, oh, so interesting. Dr. Belcombe ran Clifton Asylum, and in January 1834, Anne had Walker put under his care for a month to make sure she was well enough to get married, as Walker was known to be a bit skittish and had a nervous temperament. Oh, okay, so she had anxiety, sounds yeah. like. In fact, Walker struggled with mental health issues, particularly anxiety and depression, for the majority of her life, in addition to struggling to accept her own sexuality as it related to her religious faith. Yeah, that would be hard. And then if you were anxious to... Yeah. And you were barely out in the open, that would be incredibly anxiety-inducing. Yeah. So I don't want it to seem like she was, like, committing her to an asylum because she thought she was crazy. She was just she having like her... She was being a caring person who wanted to make sure that she was she was well enough to make the choice. Yes. She wanted to be with her. Like, yeah. that's kind of the ultimate act of love. Yes. Yeah. She just kind of wanted to not only, like, make sure she was okay, but also perhaps to, like, sort of ease her anxieties and things like that in regards mm-hmm. to their marriage. Right. Anne very much wanted their union blessed by God, which is why she and Walker were united at Holy Trinity Church, Goodram Gate in York on Easter Sunday in 1834, in what is often noted as the first lesbian wedding in British recorded history. Wow. The pair took communion and exchanged rings together and viewed this shared service as their official wedding, even though their marriage wasn't formally recognized by the church or the law. Yeah. 
in a March 30th, 1834 entry, Anne notes her thoughts about their quote-unquote wedding. Quote, three kisses, better to her than to me, at Good Ramgate Church at 1035. Miss W. and I and Thomas stayed the sacrament. Almost all the congregation stayed, and though the church too small to hold many, the service took 40 minutes. The first time I ever joined Miss W. in my prayers, I had prayed that our union might be happy. She had not thought of doing as much for me, end quote. Mm -hmm. Anne was very fond of Gothic architecture, and following her marriage to Walker, she began revamping Shibden Hall in a Gothic revival style, desiring yeah. to turn it into a mansion. She had designs to make it into like a castle, but her friends were like, yeah, Please no. don't. <laughs> Please don't be the goth vampire couple. She, they were basically like, you're not royalty, like simmer down. Right. So, I mean, you got the money and you're kind of bored and... Yep. People already think you're weird, so yeah. <laughs> what's left? Yep. <laughs> Live out your dreams. Follow your dreams. <laughs> she made a number of additions, including the Norman-style West Tower, which housed the entirety of her library and her new study upon its completion in 1838. She also added on to and updated the eastern end of the property, including the addition of a tunnel that was dug under the building so the staff could move about without disturbing anyone in the main house. Nice. Nice. <laughs> in June 1839, the two Anns, as they were called, embarked on a tour of Eastern Europe for what was set to be a two-year trip. They traveled from Dunkirk, Belgium, to Germany, Copenhagen, then Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia, into modern-day Georgia, the country. All of those, all of those, okay. I was like, and then just Georgia? Like, <laughs> <laughs> they really love peaches. <laughs> right. I mean, they do, as we are. It was there in Kutai, where, I'm assuming that's how you say it, where Anne developed a terrible fever and died suddenly on September 22nd, 1840, at the age of 49. Oh, very young. Kutai was at the base of the Caucasus Mountains, and it's believed that she suffered from a tick bite. Ooh, so she might have had Lyme. Well, at this time, there was a great sickness, which was basically a form of the plague that was transmitted via tick bite. It's fun that way. And Gross. actually many people passed in this area of Europe during that time from the same sort of affliction. 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 Anne's remains were embalmed and transported back to England, where she was buried at Halifax Minster on April 29th, 1841. Prior to her death, Anne gave Walker a life interest in Shibden Hall. And a life interest is described as a form of right that lasts for the lifetime of the person benefiting from that right who is then known as a life tenant. So she just, she was able to give her the property without being able to give her the property. Correct. Yeah. Walker also gave Shibden Hall to her paternal cousins to inherit. But because of this life interest, Walker was able to retain residence and rights to the property. Good. So it was something where she like, she had to keep it within the family, mm -hmm. but she also wanted to make sure that Walker wasn't going to just get like taken care of. That she wasn't just going to get kicked out. Right. Because she could, you know, yep. you never know. That is until 1843, when Walker oh, wow. was declared of unsound mind and was forcibly removed from the property and taken to an asylum in York, where she was once again put under the care of Dr. Belcombe. At least it was somebody she knew. Mm -hmm. That really sucks. After a brief stint at the asylum, she returned to her family home of Cliff Hill in Lightcliff, West Yorkshire, where she died on February 25th, 1854, at the age of 50. I think I read that she died from, at least on her death certificate, it was noted as brain swelling. So I'm not quite sure what oh, she would have gotten. Could have hit her head at any time. Or maybe she, she, had, she contracted fever. Some, fever. I was just going to say. Jeez, feet. yeah. A lot of things could cause brain swelling. Oh, yeah. Awful. For several decades following her death, no one was really all the wiser regarding Anne's sexuality. In the mid-1890s, roughly 50 years after her death, a descendant named John Lister, who was the last Lister to inherit and inhabit Shibden Hall, found and decoded her journals with the help of his friend Arthur Burrell, thereby discovering her sexual preferences and very explicit encounters. That's hilarious. As a gay man himself, John quickly reburied the diaries versus bringing them to light in an effort to protect his own sexual identity and avoid any sort of scandal. I mean, good on him. Yeah. You, you gotta do what makes you feel safe. 
Yep. Anne's secrets would once again be brought to light a century later by Helena Whitbread, a 51-year-old Halifax local who spent five years transcribing and decoding Anne's diaries after Shibden Hall was opened as a museum. Whitbread published fully decoded and transcribed sections of them in the late 1980s and early 1990s, specifically in 1988 and 1992. Mm Mm-hmm. In 2011, UNESCO recognized Anne's journals as a, quote, pivotal document, end quote, and added them to the memory of the World Register due to the fact that they were, quote, a comprehensive and painfully honest account of lesbian life, end quote. Oh, I bet she would be like kind of proud and also a little mortified. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, but yeah, it, it, I mean, that's the joke yeah. of it, a preserved piece of history. That's mm-hmm. incredible. The entirety of Anne's diaries have not been transcribed, and Anne Choma, who was the lead consultant for the BBC series Gentleman Jack, based on the life of Anne Lister, as well as Sally Wainwright, who created, wrote, and co-directed the show, Mm -hmm. are in talks to find ways to transcribe her journals in their entirety. And they also plan to digitize everything. Right. If you visit the Holy Trinity Church in York today, you'll find a blue rainbow ringed plaque in honor of Anne and Walker that reads, quote, Anne Lister, 1791 to 1840, gender nonconforming entrepreneur, celebrated marital commitment without legal recognition to Anne Walker in this church, Easter 1834, end quote. Nice. This plaque, which was unveiled in 2018, is the first in UK history to be bordered with rainbow colors as a symbol of recognition for LGBTQ history. That's really lovely. The Halifax Civic Trust also created a plaque in her honor in 2019 that reads, quote, Anne Lister, 1791 to 1840, diarist, businesswoman, landowner, traveler, and lesbian who recorded much of her personal life in a secret code. She lived at Shibden Hall from 1815 to 1840, end quote. And it was unveiled at Shibden Hall on April 3rd, 2019. Awesome. To date, Anne Lister is known as the first modern lesbian and embodied the 19th century equivalent of a butch lesbian. Oh, well. And that is the very interesting story of the life of Anne Lister. I loved that. See, I told you you would. Okay. I'm just glad she didn't get like hardcore murdered. Yeah. Well, she did get murdered by the tick, but the tick didn't know who she was. Yeah. The tick wasn't like, I'm going to take down this lesbian. (laughs) Down with differences. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a discriminatory tick. (laughs) I don't believe love is love. Today's episode is brought to you by Podcorn. Podcorn is a marketplace connecting podcasters to amazing podcast sponsorship opportunities such as host read ads, interview segments, topical discussions, and more. Seriously, they have so much and it's such a nice interface. I am responsible for the Podcorn ads for this podcast. And if you guys haven't already noticed, I am terrible at this stuff. So it's been really nice and easy as a way for me to kind of help contribute to the podcast by getting us connected with sponsors that actually work with you guys, our listeners that work with us. They have everything from sponsoring other podcasts to independent and businesses and it's so easy so you can find the sponsorship that works for you and you can kind of pick and choose what works best for you and your podcast record something send it their way give them a price and if they like it they'll work with you and it's really just that easy so you never give up your rights to your podcast and podcorn is here to support you at every step and ensure you're protected and compensated for the work that you do for brands the marketplace mission is to give podcasters transparency creative freedom and full control of how and when we monetize interested click the link in our show notes to sign up for podcorn and start browsing sponsorship opportunities today Hi there, my name is Elise and I am a lawyer in the Pacific Northwest. I host this podcast, True Crime Cat Lawyer, with my co-host Winston, my cat. She is a mustache, bow-tied, fierce little ball of sass and we both come to you every other Thursday telling some stories from our hometown of the Pacific Northwest. 
We try to cover cases from Oregon, Washington, Alaska. We're hoping to cover some from Canada soon. And we just like telling crime stories that are lesser known in the true crime community, but we do also cover some of the big ones. And if you are interested in learning more about our podcast, True Crime Cat Lawyer, you can head over to our website, truecrimecatlawyer.com, or you can send us a quick email at truecrimecatlawyer at gmail.com. We're also on Instagram and Twitter, and we are available on pretty much every podcast platform that you will listen to. We hope you enjoy what you hear, and we hope you'll tune in. Thanks. And this week's podcast plug is the True Crime Cat Lawyer podcast. Oh my God, I love it already. I know, which is this month's Oracle Network podcast of the month. Hey! This is such a great podcast for numerous re- reasons. Mm-hmm. So Elsie has a lovely voice. Mm-hmm. The cases are short and bingeable. Okay. It's got catchy music. Awesome. And you can't go wrong with a cat named Winston. Very true. Yeah. I had a cat named Rufus and that my thing. Good name. Good, strong name, Winston. And he has a little mustache. Of course he does. That checks out. So if you enjoy a true crime podcast without the chit chat filler and hearing about crimes in the Pacific Northwest, I encourage you to check out True Crime Cat Lawyer. We will have a link to it in the show notes, as well as a link to the Oracle Network if you want to check out their full catalog, which we are also a part of. I feel a little attacked about the chit chat part. <laughs> Well, I mean, there are some, some people don't like the chit chat, you know, some people know. just like the straight facts. So I know I've been there. I've, I've been that listener before, but well, they're like, if you don't like the chit chat, it's like, ouch. <laughs> I know. It's literally the only thing I contribute to your experience. <laughs> if you don't like Madison. <laughs> right. If Madison is trash, listen to this one. <laughs> <laughs> you watch the listenership just skyrocket. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> We're the Maddie haters. I feel bad's hurt now. <laughs> and since this is our one year anniversary, I did put out a call on Twitter a little bit too late to see if people had questions they wanted to ask us. And we did get a, okay. a few. Okay. So Ariel from the Malice podcast wants to know if you could have one low key superpower, so not flying or inv- invisibility. More like the ability to never drop a tray or being able to master any newly trending dances in one try kind of thing. What would it be? I don't think mine is very like low, low key. But the first thing that came in, came to my mind would be like luck mm-hmm. so that I could win lottery stuff and just like give money to people. That's always been like one of my dreams is winning like one of those outrageous publishers clearinghouse things of like mm-hmm. $5,000 a week for the rest of your life. And then I'm like, $2,000 of that goes to like whoever mm-hmm. every week. That'd be so cool. Like you guys want a spa day? Check it out. You can do it the first week of June. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that would yeah. just be really cool. But in terms of like low key. I think that's fair. It's like a low key. Do you think yeah. that's low key enough? Like just enough luck to win stuff like that. But I wouldn't hoard it because yeah, no good comes from hoarding money. Yeah, as history Almost. has shown. Right. Yeah. So I, th- I think that's what I would like to do. With mo money yeah. comes mo problems. Right. This is why you give it away. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Mine would be to be able to pick up a new language. That's a good one. To yeah, just that's really cool. To just like go somewhere and just be able to pick up the language without really having to try. Mm-hmm. That'd be really fun. I would. It'd make travel so much easier rather than being like, let me get out my handy dandy translator. You'd be so much more hireable too. Mm -hmm. I can speak five languages. For now. (laughs) (laughs) Until I learn more. Until you send me out. Until you send me to other countries. Yeah. You just work for the travel channel. Oh my God. What do you do? I don't know. They just send me places and I learn the language. I just... I learn the language and they think it's hilarious. And then they just send me somewhere else. (laughs) They just pay me to go learn languages. It's great. Yeah, That'd be awesome. (laughs) She's so smart. You're just sitting there at like restaurants, nail salons, Mm. the lobby of hotels. I don't even use it for anything cool. I just learned the language. You just learned the language and you're like, did you learn it? Yep. Cool. (laughs) Now go here. (laughs) I just go shopping places and I'm able to like speak the language. It's nothing crazy. 
Karen from the Chicklet podcast wants to know if you could go back in time to any period or event in history, what would it be? I hate this kind of question. I know you do. Not, not because like it's, it's nothing against the person who asked this question, but I think of this all the time as like, if I could go back in history as a white man, I would do like probably like anything ever, but like people were so stinky and dirty and Mm -hmm. you weren't allowed to read (laughs) Yeah, for so long. What would I want? I mean, I'd want to see a dinosaur before it ate me. So like maybe that. Oh, that'd be cool. Right. Cause you know, you know, you're doomed anyway. And like me as a diabetic, I'd die pretty quick <laughs> in that time. So I could just like see a few dinosaurs before my body was like, and we're done. Time's up. Easy <laughs> pray. Easy pray. No, right. no insulin in the Jurassic period. What about you? I think it'd be fun to go back to like the roaring... Yeah, like right uh, after like during twenties or what? Right after the first pandemic. <laughs> yeah, what was the time period where the golden age of Hollywood before they had any rules and regulations? You could just go there, and they had like the craziest sets and costumes. I'm looking it up right now. Yeah, the 1920s. Uh, so probably mm-hmm. mm, before the stock market crash, though. I want to go back in time to go to Paris to see Josephine Baker dance. Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. Because I think that would be awesome because she sounded like yeah. such a cool person. And I just right. think it'd be awesome to just see her perform just once. Just experience it once. Yeah, I think that'd be awesome. Mm-hmm. Good one. So. And you wouldn't get eaten by the end of it. I wouldn't, hopefully. And hopefully I wouldn't get killed either. <laughs> right. Why are you wearing pants? You're different. <laughs> <laughs> Drown her in the sand. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. And this is the last question. Alex from okay. Weird Distractions wants to know, what's one modern case that reminds you of a historic case? Oh, man. This one's kind of hard. I was trying to think of it before we even started recording, and I was like, I don't know. That is hard. Because, I mean... The only thing I can kind of think of is, was it Andrea Yates? She, to an extent, reminds me a little bit of Marianne Cotton because she also killed all of her children. Yeah. So that's... But did she, but she didn't drown her children for insurance. Yeah, but she still killed all of her kids. Yeah. That's the weird connection I'm making right there. I'm trying to think. I don't, I don't really know. Like... Another one that I thought of which again, this is a little bit of a stretch, is comparing the Eliza Lamb case to the case of the Sunderland man because they both drowned Mm. under unusual circumstances. Yeah. And you don't quite know what actually happened. Yeah, that's fair. Although for him, we have no idea who he is, so. Right. Which I read somewhere that they're, they exhumed him, I think, and they're going to try and do DNA testing to figure out who he is. Crazy. Um... Who, who was the, I feel like, wasn't the guy that fed victims to his pigs, wasn't he, like, recent in Canada? Robert Picton. He's fairly recent. Yeah, that was in, like, the 1950s. Or, he, yeah, he was born in the 1950s. Born in the 50s. When was he caught? 2002. Yeah. I don't know. I keep thinking of that. And then, like, the guy who was a gardener, he was in Canada, too, and he buried all of his victims in the landscaping he did in people's backyards. Oh. Yeah, I just feel like that type of stuff is so would would have been like so common in like crimes Mm -hmm. back in the day because it would have been so easy if you were already working the land, just like off someone, put them in the ground, throw some stuff. (laughs) That case reminds me a little bit of Minnie Dean, too, because remember all those kids went missing and they also were hog farmers? Yeah. Even though it wasn't said that the pigs ate the kids, like I'm just making that connection. Kind of implied. Yeah. On that super morbid note, what's right. something good you'd like to share this week? Um, <laughs> dang. Well, so the mask mandate is officially lifted in the state of Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And my partner and I are fully vaccinated. And we went to, like, we live, like, semi-long distance. So we have date nights once a week. Mm-hmm. And our, we usually, like... Yeah outside or eat in the car or you know whatever this time we went to a sports bar and I, I picked it because it had some games and we happened to go on bingo night nice 
and we were able to play bingo. And while, you know, the majority of the people that were there didn't have their masks on, we were all spaced Mm -hmm. comfortably. So I didn't feel weird about it. Like, of course, it was kind of strange at first and it Mm -hmm. felt like almost too normal, but we got to like be in a, you know, a large room of at least 20 people Mm -hmm. who were comfortably spaced playing bingo. And it was really refreshing. It was really fun. Probably one of the best date nights we've had in a while where we were able to relax. Like at Every time I go into a place now where like I have my mask off for Mm -hmm. a period of time, it kind of feels like what I would assume like having, having marijuana where it's legal (laughs) for the first time, you know, like having an edible in public because you bought it at a store and you can't. Bought it at a dispensary. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like it feels wrong, but it's not wrong. Mm Mm-hmm. So it was really nice. He actually won one of the rounds. He won nice. like 30 bucks. I sound like such an old person, but I actually really enjoy bingo. I think it's fun. I fucking love bingo. <laughs> actually, like we were stoked because I, I had picked it last minute and we were like, uh, yeah, whatever. And then the waitress came by and she's like, are you guys going to play bingo? And we were like, what? <laughs> And he immediately like got cash so we could get like a dabber. (laughs) You're like, fuck yes, we're going to play bingo. Yeah, Yeah, we're going to play bingo. Yeah, it was so great. And I was like two spaces away from winning a thousand dollars. Oh, God. Yeah. Like it was just, it was fun. It was really nice. It felt very normal. I played bingo with one of my old girlfriends a long, long time ago. This was back when I was still in college. And it was super late at night. It was like 10 o'clock at night which is insane to me. And it was like just us. So we're like 20 somethings. And then a bunch of like elderly women who obviously have been doing this for a while because they had like their lucky troll dolls and things like that sitting out in front of them. There were people with trolls. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, they had like eight different dabbers and things Mm -hmm. like that. And I won at Four Corners and I won like 50 bucks. And the looks I got from those yep. women. Oh my God. I thought one of them was going to like shank me. Are you? It's like mm-hmm. death glare. There's a bingo hall close to where I want to move back to. Nice. And so, you know, all crises out of the, like hoping that nothing else happens. Maybe we can go to that bingo hall. That'd be fun. Together. That'd be fun. Yeah. We still have to get together at some point to play the Donner party game that Emily got us. We should do like a live. Yeah, I was thinking we could do like a live stream. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do a double date thing. You and your partner come over and Thomas and I and we just set up set up the video and play the Donner Party game. That could be fun. Could be fun. All right. What's what's a good thing for you? My something good is similar to you. I did a while back order one of the Everly food food sensitivity tests. Mm hmm. And I got my results back on Tuesday this past week. Apparently, I am super allergic to both egg whites and egg yolks. Andies. <laughs> so now I have to avoid those at all costs and anything that has egg in it. While well, you do an elimination. Mm-hmm. Because you don't have to avoid them forever. Do an elimination and then build a tolerance slowly over time. Yeah. How are you feeling? Yeah. So right now I am doing an elimination diet. I am allergic to, I think, 22 foods with my highest allergies being to eggs, obviously. And a surprising discovery is I actually am not super allergic to gluten like I was told. It's Uh like it's like a very mild reaction, like just outside the normal spectrum. Mm -hmm. So I can eat bread and stuff. But interestingly enough, I'm like not super allergic, but I'm way more allergic to spelt, which is in like whole grains and things like that. So I'm like, okay, that's interesting. So bring back the bread. (laughs) Right. So that'll be awesome. But yeah, Yeah. right now I'm eliminating everything that I am super allergic to and mildly allergic to from my diet. And I'm going to do it for 30 days. I feel pretty good. Like right now, since starting the elimination diet, I've lost four pounds. Congratulations. Thank you. If that pound a day trend continues, I could probably reach my goal weight in a few months, which would be awesome. I know that's not what's going to happen, but... I mean, you can always believe it, manifest it in your life. Yep. That'd be awesome to be able to confidently wear a swimsuit by the end of the summer. Of course, it's by the end. Yeah. Well, it'd be in August. So 
Absolutely. I could be like rocking a swimsuit for my 38th birthday. Oh my God, I'm going to be 38. Well, let's cross that bridge when we get to it. I feel so fucking old. I know I'm not, but I just feel right. so fucking old. I bet. Anyway, so that's I feel much better knowing what I'm allergic to. I do have an appointment with my primary in a couple of weeks, and I plan to send that along to her so I can mm-hmm. talk to her about it and see if there's any sort of like dietitian I should talk to to come up with a plan to kind of stick with it. Because there are certain things that I'm allergic to that would be fairly easy to substitute forever. Yeah, like if I need to substitute eggs, like find something else for eggs, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can make it happen. It's not as difficult as it first sounds because you're if you think of eggs, it's like eggs are in everything. They're in a lot. Yeah, they're in a lot of things, but they're not in everything. So I could make it work. It's just a matter Mm -hmm. of I need to be more mindful of reading the ingredients of things. And I should be more mindful of that anyway. So it's fine. Well, on that note, shall we? We shall. So you can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at yieldcrimepod and on Instagram at yieldcrimepodcast. We're on YouTube. You can find us by either clicking the link in our show notes or you can search for Yield Crime Podcast. If you'd like to send us something, you can send it to us at our P.O. Box, which is Yield Crime Podcast, P.O. Box 341, Wyoming, Minnesota, 55092. If you're like, I can't remember that, go on our website and go to the contact page. We also have it listed there. Mm -hmm. And there's also a form there if you would rather write to us with the form versus sending us an email, which you can do at yieldcrimepodcast at Mm gmail.com. We only have one more week of questions after this. So if you want to continue to hear us answering random questions from listeners, please send some questions in. It's fair game. As long as it's not something super racy or intrusive, we will probably answer it. Yeah, I agree. Um, if you'd like to don't support, make it weird, don't make it weird because <laughs> we'd like to have some mystery, even though we're like in the world. Yeah, we're already in the, the interwebs. Yeah, leave some mystery. If you'd like to support the show, but you can't do it financially, a great way to do it would be by leaving us a five star rating and review. Mm-hmm. And this week we have a review from Jay Consignado via Apple Podcasts, and they mm-hmm. say, with the listen, five stars. Two great hosts with amazing chemistry. Love the vibe and the way they tell the stories. Their title might be ye old, but this is going to be one of your new favorites to listen to on your podcast rotation. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. If you would like to support us financially, you can do so on Buy Me a Coffee to leave us a one-time donation. You can also support us on a monthly basis by joining our Patreon for as low as a dollar mm-hmm. a month. You can enjoy other amazing patrons, such as our friends who are donating at the five tier level or higher. And that includes our friends, Rebecca, Aaron and Trevor. Thank you so much for your continued support of our show. It means a lot to us. And you guys are awesome. The best. Best of the best. Uh, you can also support us by purchasing some of our merch and repping us out in the wild. Mm-hmm. We are going to be adding some new pride designs for you to check out this month and they will only be live the month of June. I'm not quite sure what the dates of the month of June are for sales, but obviously we will post those on social media as we learn what they are. Mm -hmm. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale. As old as crime.